Welcome to Making the Cut Podcast with Chris Hill and Sean Winner, where we help you succeed in life and business by sharing principles and strategies that guide some of the most successful people in the world. Welcome to episode 33 of the Making the Cut Podcast. I'm Chris Hill with my co-host, Sean Winner. Today we're talking with Rich Aurelia, former Major League Baseball player turned winemaker. Before chatting with him, though, here's a quick word from our sponsor. That's right, Chris. Le Cordon Bleu is considered to be synonymous with outstanding quality, setting standards in both the culinary arts and the hospitality industry for over 120 years. If you want to set yourself apart from the competition and prepare for a career of exciting opportunities, learn from the very best of new world innovation and cuisine with the principles, techniques, and artistry of French traditions. Apply now at cordonbleu.edu. And also, this month through March 21st, Entrepreneurial Chef is hosting the Plate It Like You Mean It contest in collaboration with Oneida Food Service, where one grand prize winner will win a full tabletop installation in 2018 from Oneida, valued at $24,000. And not only that, there's a Voter's Choice Award winner who will get $10,000 in tabletop products, a first runner-up who will get $5,000 in tabletop products, and a second runner-up who will get $2,000 in tabletop products. How does it work? work, you might ask or wonder. If you snap a photo of your featured dish and then explain why winning the grand prize would change your life, you will have a chance to win the grand prize. So for those that are interested, you can go to entrepreneurialchef.com forward slash Oneida. That's O-N-E-I-D-A. And you can enter. Again, it runs through March 21st. So get those entries in now. And with that, Chris, very excited to talk to Rich. As a uh, as a former baseball card collector, I'm sure I probably have his rookie card and several of his cards in my collection in the closet. I think I probably had the same, my friend. Uh, yeah, you Rich and I connected a couple years ago, and he's been uh, making some wine uh, since his baseball days. But if you don't know Rich, he is, yes, a former Major League Baseball player, playing for a number of teams, though most notably for the San Francisco Giants, where he played 12 of his 15 seasons. After a long, successful career, he retired in 2009. Now, in addition to broadcasting for the Giants, Aurelia and his former teammate and the current manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers, Dave Roberts, teamed up to start Red Stitch Wine, a label out of Napa Valley. Sean, I'm excited to talk with Rich about his career and what's made him successful and to hear any advice he might have for his entrepreneurs out there. With that, Sean, let's hop in. Yeah, let's do it. Hey there, Rich. How's it going? Hey, doing good today. How are you guys? Doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's a real pleasure. You know, being a big baseball fan myself, uh, it's, it's fun to have you here. Maybe you could uh, give the audience, for those that might not know you, a bit about your background, you know, in baseball, and then now kind of what you're doing up to the, these days. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, my name is Rich Aurelia. I was a uh, Major League Baseball player for just under 15 years. With uh, Most of my time was um, with San Francisco Giants, 11 out of my 15 years. And I also spent some time in Cincinnati, San Diego, and Seattle, and, uh, you know, as you, as you guys know, San Francisco is one of the best uh, food and wine cities in the world. So uh, I quickly fell in love with those two things, playing there for a really long time. And, um, and once 2009 rolled around my last season, I decided to retire. And uh, by that time, I was already involved in Red Stitch, which is uh, our wine that, uh, that we make. And we started that venture in uh probably around late 2007 uh myself and dave roberts uh the manager of the dodgers right now and uh, another buddy of ours john mysick um so we were actually really happy this past you know this past year to celebrate our 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 10th harvest which uh we're very proud to still be around after 10 years in the wine industry so uh you know that's what i got going now and uh i also do some part-time broadcasting for the Giants. I do their pre and post game show out of San Francisco on NBC uh, Sports Bay Area. So um, that's pretty much where I'm at now with, with uh, baseball's over. And now it's basically more baseball and, and some wine mixed in there. I love it. Now, Rich, a portion of our audience and, and a lot of the things that we talk about for them, they they want to be the best. They want to strive to be elite in various areas of their lives and different types of food entrepreneurship or different types of entrepreneurship. So I'm curious, you know, you were not only able to make the big leagues 
quote unquote, but make a very respectable career. It spanned a decade and a half, various teams. You had an all-star appearance. So aside from talent, what do you think helped you be in this elite category, if you will, that, that you were able to separate yourself from what some of the other individuals or aspiring athletes were doing? Well, I, I, uh, geez, I think there's a number of things, you know, and, and it's, it's so much easier now that you're you know, now that I'm out of it and I'm older and, and I'm a father and, and I see things a little bit differently, I think uh, one of the main things for me was uh, just perseverance and patience. Um, you know, I wasn't a high draft pick out of college. Uh, I wasn't a guy that was supposed to make it. I was a fringe guy that wasn't supposed to be an everyday player. And, uh, you know, to, to have the perseverance and the patience to, to wait it out and to continue to outwork everybody and work harder than everybody else, uh, to make myself the best player that I could be, um, was something that I, I, I was, I was very good at and something that pushed me. Um, you know, I, I was a type of player that I hated when people told me, you know, I wasn't able to do something, you know, even though I might not have been able, I was going to give everything I had to try and succeed at it. Um, until I basically had, had you know, exhausted all, all, all reason or all ways of, of succeeding. Um, so I think for me, just throughout the, the minor leagues and the major leagues was, you know, the perseverance and the patience, um, you know, and, and, and I think another thing is in, in sports, a lot of times, I'm sure a lot of other industries, you know, I, I couldn't worry about what I couldn't control. Uh, I couldn't control if my name was in the lineup every day. I couldn't control if I was being traded or not. Um, so I, I think as I got older and had more years under my belt, I understood these things a little bit better. And, um, you know, the funny thing is that at the end of my 15 year career and in, in the last year when I really didn't play too much, I felt like I was probably the smartest player that I had been in my whole career. But that's when the that's when the skills start to deteriorate. <laughs> you get older, so uh, it's hard to put them together. But you know, I'm I'm very proud of the 15 years that I put in, and you know, thankfully stayed healthy and and made some great friends and great connections along the way. Well, and, and I'm sure it, it took patience over you know the course of your career, but but also just looking at a baseball season itself, you know, 162 games. What's that? like as a player i'm sure it's really exhausting at times it, it, it's a grind it really is because it not only is it 162 games but now it's over i think now this season it's over like 175 or 180 days and then you count in spring training which is seven to eight weeks so it, it does take up a huge amount of your of your time during a, a year during a season during your day uh, you're away from your family a lot. Um, so, so it is a very grinding, you know, type of mentality you need to have to do it. And listen, to be honest, you spend more time with your teammates and in your clubhouse than you do in your own home. So um, those guys become, you know, your de facto family uh, when you're at the ballpark. Uh, but, but it is a grind. But after a while, you know, you just kind of get used to it. You know, it's, you know, we always say it's like Groundhog Day, the movie, you know, it's usually every day is pretty much the same and you get up and do the same thing. And, you know, I could think back and remember, I used to love traveling and going to different cities and hopefully we'd get in a city on an off day and get to go to a good restaurant for dinner that night. And I remember about my 12th or 13th year was the first time I actually got in a hotel room in a city where I woke up the next morning we, I think we got in probably around 3 a.m., maybe 4 a.m., and I woke up the next day, you know, probably <laughs> wasn't breakfast time. It was probably lunchtime. But um, I remember waking up, and I, I asked myself, okay, where am I? What city am I in right now? Mm-hmm. You know, it's such a grind, and, you know, you have to go over to the shades and open the shades up and see where you're at. Um, but it's such a grind, and, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of work, and, and you know, you, you really need to give all of yourself to, to be successful. Love it. Now, what was this period like when you went from, you know, you, you said you weren't maybe the first round draft pick or whatnot, so maybe a little bit of an average guy to this now big time athlete and people knowing you and reaching a certain level of perhaps celebrity status. What was that period like? Was it challenging for you? Uh, because, you know, a lot of our audience 
as they start building their brand, they start getting thrust into the limelight. And, you know, some of them may experience some challenges, which I can see could potentially have some yeah. parallels yeah, with it, you. It, it was, you know, it, it was a little weird sometimes and it still is a little weird sometimes because um, when you when you play a sport or you're a high profile celebrity, people basically envision you as that person that they see on TV or they read your book or that they see you do interviews. So, you know, my, my joke was always to people, you know, they knew me as the player. I was employee number 35, my Jersey number, and they knew me mm-hmm. as that guy on the field, but they don't know you as, you know, what, what, per, what type of person you are, or who you are as a person. And, you know, for me, it was always funny because you'd go out to eat or something and somebody would come up and ask you for an autograph and, you know, then you'd walk down the street and somebody would stop you to say hi. And, you know, it, it, it is a uh, an awkward circumstance when it first happens. But again, like everything else, you just you kind of get used to it and, and you grow with it and you evolve through it. And, uh, you know, I, I played with some some players, some big time guys that, you know, were, were the greatest players in the world, but they just. You know, they weren't a people person, per se, where they were comfortable in that kind of surrounding or or people recognizing them or coming up to them all the time. And I think it's all dependent upon, you know, the individual on how you handle it and how you grow through it. I mean, because just, you know, if I look back over 15 years, I mean, I'm definitely not the same person I was from day one when I got to the big leagues to the last day I was in the big leagues. I, I grew as a person. I grew as a player. Um, you know, you grow as a man, you, you grow as everything. So, um, you know, I think individually it's all how you handle it in your own mind and your own heart and how you want to deal with it. And I've, you know, I realize that I am, you know, I am who I am, but I'm also a brand that people know and people recognize as being a, a ball player or a former ball player. And, uh, you know, I kind of just run with that. That's great. Yeah, I, as you were mentioning, being a different person than you were, you know, fifteen or twenty years ago, it, it reminds me of you know I was doing doing some reading and I saw that Aaron Judge, the uh, you know reigning AL uh, Rookie of the Year, didn't he was a huge Giants fan, didn't look up to you know Barry Bonds or Jeff Kent, but looked up to you as a uh, being a shortstop, which is pretty awesome, I think, for you. Now you kind of being a mentor, and I'm sure in the later stages of your career, you were kind of the the clubhouse guy who kind of helped the younger guys along. What would you tell your you know, 21 or 22 year old self? Oh man, I, I I think the the first thing I would say is you know don't take yourself or what you do too seriously. Um, when when you do that, I just think it the you know the game becomes or your job basically it's not fun anymore. Baseball is a game of failure. It, it, it really is, uh, especially on the offensive side of things. And I remember when I was younger, I, I'd take it home with me and I'd be, you know, all ticked off for the whole night. And then uh, so if I can go back, I just say, you know, don't don't take it too seriously or take yourself too seriously. You know, yes, it's a big time sport and you're on TV and you're making good money. But at the same time. You know, it's a lot easier to do when you're having fun instead of beating yourself up up over it. And, um, you know, and I think for me, honestly, I think a lot of that changed for me when I became a dad, um, because then I felt like, oh, OK, now there's somebody else counting on me for everything that has nothing to do with baseball. And they don't care how I do, you know, day in and day out, whether I go five for five or over for five with five strikeouts. So, uh I think that was a huge turning point in my career um, when I had my first son and, you know, just started taking things a little bit lighter on the field. And so, Rich, as the career was coming to an end, how did you deal with the fact that baseball, which meant so much to you through the years, was now coming to an end, that chapter was closing, and you were kind of transitioning, essentially? Was there any either identity crisis that you went through or like, how did you, how did you transition then to now being more entrepreneurial and then getting involved with wine and stuff? How did you, how did you handle that transition? It, period? it was difficult. Uh, I, I'm not going to lie about that. It was very difficult because you, 
you go from doing something that you've done since, I mean, I, since I can remember. I was playing baseball since I was a little kid. And now all of a sudden, it's not there anymore. And there's no way it could be there anymore because I wasn't going to go out and play in any senior leagues or anything like that. I was like, I was done. And to have that first, um, you know, the hardest part for me was that first spring training after I retired. Um, that was really difficult because I'm sitting at home and, and I tried to play in 2010, but just the opportunities I was looking for just weren't there. And I remember saying to myself, man, all my buddies are at the ballpark right now all day getting ready to play a game or spring training and I'm here and I shouldn't be here. I should be with those guys. Um, so it was a difficult transition for about the first like six to eight months. But once I was, you know, out of it a little bit and separated and I started getting more into the, our wine business, um, you know, things changed for me. And I, I will say this, I, I totally enjoyed my last year in 2009 because I knew that there may not be an opportunity the following year. So I talked to a friend of mine and he told me, Hey, you know what? You just got to treat, you know, you always hear treat every game like it's your last game. That's what I did that year. He told me that and I really embraced it. And whether I was playing, whether I wasn't playing, you know, I tried to do whatever I could to help my teammates. Um, I really, really enjoyed my last year playing the game and uh you know i wouldn't change that for anything but you know when you move on and you find out you know again you're not employee number 35 anymore now you're just you know you're just you at home and that's the time when you got to try and find you know what do you want to be where do you want to go in your life and how are you going to stay busy yeah that's great so let's let's dive into red stitch you know how did it come into existence um, you're an athlete for so long, but did you kind of have the entrepreneurial bug, you know, being a finance major, wanting to get into the, something on your own? Well, I'll tell you what, if I was looking to make money right out of the gate, the wine industry wasn't <laughs> to get into. Um, but um, it started, I, I want to say we officially started in the spring of 2008 uh we were in spring training uh with the giants and dave roberts my partner uh in red stitch was with the giants at the time and and he was injured he hurt his knee and dave was a speed guy so if his knees or legs were shot he was done so he decided he was going to retire and about two weeks after he went home um i got a call and he said hey you know I need to do something in the wine industry. And um, at the time, I actually thought he was asking me to be on board with him. And I said, I'm in, you know, what do you want to do? And I think <laughs> he was maybe just bouncing an idea off me. <laughs> but, uh, but we, you know, we kept in touch and we kept talking and we decided, you know, a month or two later, you know, why don't we just make some wine? We'll start really small. I'll, you know, since I was still up in the Bay Area, um, I was going to interview different winemakers, people we knew just from our connections for years of going up to, you know, Napa and Sonoma. And uh, we'd basically, you know, kick in a few bucks and start making some wine. And that's really how it started. We, we met our winemaker at a wine tasting the year prior, and he was a huge Giants fan and he was a season ticket holder. Um, and it just took off from there. We started with a 2007 Napa Valley Cabernet with 150 cases. Um, and that was it. And, uh, from there we we've expanded over the years to, to now, I think we have distribution in about, uh, six or seven States. And we're waiting for a new license to come in where, uh, we'll have the ability to open a tasting room. If we decide, uh, we've increased production this year will probably be about, you know, about 1,500 cases in release in 2018. So, again, we, we started small and we decided to grow small because uh, we, we know enough people that have, you know, started in this industry and dove in with everything. And then next thing you know, they're out of the game in about three or four years. So we've steadily grown. We've steadily made some really, really good wines, got some really nice uh, ratings and scores. And, uh you know, I'm just enjoying the day-to-day -day operations of it right now. 
So I would ask, especially from like a potentially a business or even entrepreneurial standpoint, as you were diving into this venture, was there anything that came up that surprised you that you didn't see coming or any potential mistakes that you made that you all had a course correct along the way? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the first thing you understand or that's right in front of your face is the whole legal side of, you know, making an alcoholic beverage in the United States and how it how it's different basically with distribution in all different states and you got to pay the taxes in all these states so the the first year or so was really um difficult and i don't even want to say a learning experience because 10 years later i'm still learning every day about different things <laughs> you know I was, I was just online this morning looking at a certain state and what the laws are there for distribution um but you know, it, it, I think that was the first thing that hit us. I think the second thing that hit us that hit us more close to home was in 2007. We, you know, it's a great vintage for Napa Valley Cabernet. And we released our wine and right out of the gate, we got a great score from Wine Spectator. It was a great wine. And then 2008 hit and we went in for our blending session and we were like, whoa, what happened this year? You know, what, what happened to this vintage? Like this, this is nothing like, you know, we made, you know, last year or, or whatever. And, you know, I, I think we were all kind of scared. We were like, whoa, we didn't envision this happening. But, um, you know, again, it goes back to what I said earlier about the patience and perseverance. I mean, we bottled the 2008 and sat on it for, you know, a year, year and a half. And, you know, once we went back and tasted it, once it was bottled for a while and we released it, it was probably one of our more approachable wines that we've ever made. And we got great response from our mailing list people and our customers and they loved it. So um, I, I think kind of what I learned in baseball with being patient kind of took over in the wine industry because, you know, you know, wine is going to be different from, you know, January of one year to January of the next year. And, uh, you know, it's a living, breed, you know, breathing, breathing organism in the bottle. And it's going to evolve as time goes by. So, uh, yeah, those are two of the things that really kind of got us right out of the gate that, you know, at times you're like, man, what are we doing? Are we up to the task of this? But, uh, you know, we, we hung around and, you know, 10 years later, we're still hanging around making, you know, three different varietals now. So we're having a great time. And y'all are, y'all are doing a cab, a pinot and a Chardonnay, is it? Yeah, we, uh, we do a Napa Valley Cabernet, which is, uh, it's it's a blend it's not in the state grown or single vineyard and we always blend a little bit of malbec into it because we all met well dave and i met our other partner john uh through a blind malbec tasting at, at his oh, house cool. friend of a friend and uh so that's how we met john so we always mix in some malbec with our cab we also do uh we do two single vineyard pinot noirs from uh santa lucia highlands which is about 30 miles east of carmel pebble beach area um, and we do a single vineyard Chardonnay out of Santa Lucia also. And this past vintage in uh, 17, we sourced some uh, Pinot Noir fruit from uh, Russian River Valley up in Sonoma, which is what they're known for in Russian River Valley is their uh, Pinot Noir. So we got a couple tons of that, and we'll probably see how that turns out, 100 cases of it, and then see if we move forward you know, with that vineyard and making some more wines out of Russian River. So yeah, we got we got our we got our hands all over the the map in Northern California with our uh, where we source our grapes from. And I, th- I think it's interesting how you guys went the route of you know sourcing grapes versus you know buying you know plot of land and growing the grapes yourselves. I imagine not being in the industry beforehand, uh, th- there'd be a lot more um, challenges and just more hands on work to have to you know, grow and maintain and all the overhead. Is that kind of the part of the rationale behind going that route? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we made a lot of friends in this industry through the years. And one of my, uh, my best friend, Dan Costa, uh, who started Costa Brown winery, uh, in the mid mid nineties. Um, I mean, they're, they're one of the biggest producers of Pinot Noir in the world. Um, and they had not owned a vineyard until about two years ago and they sourced all their grapes and we learned from dan that once you buy property yeah okay it's an investment and you have that investment but there's also planting of the vines and when you plant vines 
you know, they take about four years to yield any fruit and then you have to get a vineyard manager and then you got to pay, you know, you know, your irrigation bills and then you got equipment. So basically it was more about the overhead uh, that we keep low and we've built relationships now with these uh, vineyard owners and, and these growers that, you know, they're like family. And uh, so basically, you, you know, you go out and you, you pay for your fruit by the ton. And, um, you know, that, that's how we do our business. And we just bring it to our winemaker's facility. And we do all our work there with the, you know, the barreling and the harvest and everything. And, and, and it's, it's kind of convenient for us where there's not a lot of outside interference coming in or overhead where, that we have to worry about it 24-7. What was the what was the process like of you all launching into the marketplace and trying to attract customers and get customers and essentially start making sales? Because there's a lot of people that conceptualize products, go through the process of bringing the products to market, but then struggle to try and get customers. What was this process like well, for you? You know what? It, it's <laughs> there's the pros and cons of being an athlete or a former athlete that's going to release a product like this. In, in, in the in the pro side of it, you know, people are like, oh, these guys are making some wine. Maybe I'll go buy some and I'll try it because they were good ball players. On the opposite side of it, a lot of your, you know, pr- premier wine drinkers or people that love wine are like, oh, great. Another athlete that's sticking his name or something on a bottle that doesn't even know what's going in it. So it, it, it is a, you know, you're walking a tightrope with that. And I think through the years, that's the first thing we wanted to separate from was being the baseball guys that made a wine. And I think it took us about, I want to say three or four years, you know, you need those consistent ratings and the consistent feedback and the good notes from your customers. And, and it is hard, even if only it was 150 cases of wine, it's hard to sell that in a market where it's very competitive, that nobody knows you and you're a new product. Um, so basically, we made the decision early on that, you know, we we're going to try and get it to as many restaurants we could that knew us. Um, and then the rest, we we're going to try and sell direct to consumer on our website because, you know, that's our best margin, uh, you know, to keep things going and to grow. So uh, it was a little difficult in the beginning. But once I think we shed that layer of oh, these guys play baseball, but you know what? They make a really good Cabernet. Um, you know, I think I'm going to get this next year again. Um, you know, and again, it's it's patience and perseverance. It really is. I mean, you can't, you know, dive in too quick and you can't get out too quick. So it was a very, very interesting <laughs> 2009, 2010 when we were releasing the, the 07 cab, but, uh, you know, thankfully, everything's gone in the right direction. And now, you know, you look every year and you see the same names that come through every year to order their allocation. and The same restaurants are calling to get the wine back in there. So it's, uh, you know, makes you feel like you've you've built the brand in the direction you want to go. But there's still a lot more work to do. Well, and it seems like you've been very intentional about, you know, being not only, you know, the one of the faces of the brand, but also in, you know, letting people know that, Hey, you know, I'm Rich Aurelia, but I also know a lot about wine and share that knowledge. And, you know, on, on Instagram, you do a great job. Obviously it's very clear that you know what you're doing. Well, again, you know, I had to learn as I, as I went and learn as I, as year, year to year, just different things would pop up. And, you know, even to the, the fact of, you know, starting to make, you know, Pinot Noir in 2011. I mean, yeah, I knew people that made Pinot Noir and I had, I love to drink Pinot Noir and I had friends that owned uh, wineries that made it, but I'm like, okay, what do we know about this? You know, what are we, what are we doing here? And let me call the partners and see if they want to buy some grapes from down in San Lucia. So uh, it's a never ending process of um, learning and branding. And I think that's the, that's one of the most important things I've learned over the last 10 years is you can always sell a good product. If the wine is good, it's going to sell and people are going to like it. 
But what you need to sell more is the brand of what Red Stitch is, of, of what Rich Aurelia, Dave Roberts, and John Mysick mean to Red Stitch and, and how we can take that to the next level. Because you want people to see that label or see that logo and be like, oh, I know those guys. I've tried their wine and I, you know, I, I really like it. And now, now it's to that point where, you know, we're, we're branding our, our product and our brand to, to get to the highest level we possibly could get to, you know, take this project to the ultimate level. And I don't know what that ultimate level is right now, but, you know, right now it's growing at a, at a slow pace, but, you know, we're, we're selling our wine and we're doing well. And I, I can't complain because it's, it's something that drives me every day. Rich, I couldn't agree with you more about having a brand story behind that product um, to, to help differentiate or stand out. So an, an advice question for you for the individuals that hear what you say and they know the importance of having this brand story. From what you learned throughout your time, what is maybe a few pieces of advice, one, two pieces of advice for crafting that story or ensuring that it is in alignment with that product that they're thinking of releasing? Yeah, well, you know, that's a great question because, you know, <clears throat> our, listen, we know our story is never going to change. We were baseball players and we were friends and we decided we wanted to get into the wine industry. But once you get to that point of what the story is, because, you, you know, the wine, wine is all about sharing and stories and family and sitting around and tasting it and having conversations. Once you get to that point, then you could fork off a little bit and, and you know, change what you do. I mean, now we do a lot of stuff with, you know, th this has offered me the opportunity to do a lot of stuff with uh, uh, charitable organizations and a lot of philanthropy uh, through wine and food. Um, you know, so I, I think the advice and, and the reason we got to that point is we had the right people in place and we had the right friends that we could lean on for advice. So I think my, my main, you know, piece of advice I would give people is if you're diving into an industry that you really don't know as well as maybe you should, you know, have a friend or somebody you really trust to give you their advice or somebody that's in that industry to give you their advice to walk you through it. And, you know, I say that purposely walk you through it. You don't want to run into it and rush through everything because next thing you know, you turn around and you're like, Oh man, I forgot about that part of part of what I need to do. So walk through it very slowly and put yourself in a position to learn as much as you possibly can. And you can only have you know one first impression, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, we were lucky enough to know so many people that, you know, we could lean on them. And even now to this day, you know, I, I got a phone call last night with my buddy about something and, you know, about this industry. And, you know, it, it's weird. <laughs> and I'm, I'm probably going to say this industry is a little different than a lot of other jobs or industries where even though the competition is fierce, most of the people are out to help everybody else that's still that, that's in the same industry. So um, <clears throat> when I can lean on my friends and call them and ask them about, hey, what distributor should I look at for, you know, this state and who should I talk to? You know, the, the answer is always there for me. And uh, I think that's very important to go into something not being 100 percent blind, maybe a little blind on some things, but that's part of the learning process. But uh rely on people that have been there and done that before you, you get in and dive in feet first. So it sounds like you've done a great job of surrounding yourself with, with great people, not only the, the winemaker, but and your, and your colleagues, but also the other folks that some people might see as competitors, but you're all out there trying to do the same thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what I, you know, as an example, um, I just came from, uh, Last week, I, I poured at a uh, pairings party for the uh, golf tournament at Pebble Beach for the Pro-Am. Um, and granted, it was my first year there. I knew some of the wineries that were there. I knew some of the people. But I didn't know a lot of the people that were attending the party, the participants. And, you know, the people that go to that Pro-Am and play as celebrities or guests, I mean, they, 
pay a pretty big penny to get in there. And, you know, I, you know, the first thing I do is I try and exchange a business card with them because you never know who you're going to run into, who may like the wine, who may be in an industry that kind of is a crossover. And you never know when you, you know, you can call that person for advice or a product that you may need for your brand or something like that. And I, I, I think, you know, that's the thing as you move forward, you know, you always have to have that open mind of, you know, how could, how could this help me in the future? And it may not hit you right then, but at least if you have the information in front of you, you can always go back to it and, and, and use it uh, to your benefit if, if, if the time is right. Love that. Now, Rich, what would you say are some parallels that you have seen between being a successful athlete in the past and then now being a successful no, entrepreneur? Man, I, you know, it's I, I think the way that I have to, you know, have that drive and the, and the will to succeed, um, you know, d- doing this now, what I do is a total different industry or job, per se or as far apart as you could probably get. But, you know, I've learned to understand that, you know, in baseball, I never knew what I was going to get every year when the season started. You could have a good year, you can have an okay year, you could have a bad year. And, you know, for an unknown reason, it just happens. Well, same thing is true for wine. I mean, you're basically, you know, you're bowing to mother nature sometimes and you're like, Hey, please give us a good growing season or please don't let it, you know, get too hot too early and we have bud break or don't let the frost come in too late where it damages the vines. So you never know from vintage to vintage what you're going to get. And I think that helps me now because I never knew in baseball, you know, what I was going to get from year to year. I mean, I know there was one year that I played in my career and I I made the all-star team and I had a, a great year. That was the only year that I can remember where, you know, I felt good every day. I was healthy every day. Everything, the ball looked big when I was hitting it. Everything fell in the right place. Um, you know, and that can happen in this industry. doesn't happen very often, but you always have to prepare, I think, for the worst. And um, as, as optimistic as I always am, you know, in the back of your mind, you always have to prepare for the worst. And I think that, that these two industries, like I said, as far apart as they are, Uh, They do have some similarities in the sense of you don't know from year to year what you're going to get. That's great advice. With uh, the fires that that took place, you know, back in the the fall of 2017, I know y'all are pretty much unscathed. Is that how things work out for you guys? Yeah, well, you know, thankfully things worked out well for us, both uh, personally and professionally. I own a home up in Healdsburg, which is in Sonoma County, and it's just north of Santa Rosa, which basically Santa Rosa took a took the brunt of the damage on the Sonoma side. Uh, I had a bunch of friends lose restaurants and homes and uh, stuff like that. And I was actually up there uh, for that week when the fires hit. Um, My kids are off from school in Phoenix, so we went up for the week. And um, I remember leaving midweek. You know, we we had a, a recommended evacuation, but not a mandatory but, um, you know, I just wanted to get out of there. And then you're praying that your your home that you just bought a couple of years ago, you're, you're praying that that's going to survive. Uh, and then on the wine side, um, you know, all our vineyards that we sourced from were safe. Our, our winemaker's facility was safe. Uh, his family was safe. He lives in Napa. So, uh, you know, thankfully, uh, on a personal note, all, all of our people and everything we have was safe. But once again, I mean, you just look, you know, at the devastation up there and, you know, I'll never forget. I went up there probably a couple of months. I've, I've done a bunch of charity stuff for it, you know, building up to now. And even going into this summer, we have some events planned, but um, I remember driving. There's a road that pretty much connects uh, Sonoma to Napa, basically Northern Napa, Calistoga area and Santa Rosa. And it's going through the mountainside and you basically a windy road and, that's where one of the main fires came through. And I remember driving through there and all I could see was uh, fireplaces, brick fireplaces standing and burned out cars. Everything else was just gone. And, uh, you know, it was a sad thing to see. And 
like I said, I had some friends that, uh, you know, didn't do too well. Actually, one of them staying at my house right now up there while they find something more permanent. We had two other families stay at our home for, for about four or five weeks apiece. Um, you know, and that's just our little way of trying to give back, you know, give these people a little normal, normalcy in their lives for their families and the kids and, uh, you know, so they can get back on track. But, you know, I, I will say this, though, and the wine industry was affected, but I don't think it's affected as much as people think that aren't around the area. And I know that's a, a huge part of their uh, business and revenues up there are basically tourists that come through. So, you know, I want people to know that the industry is still thriving. There's a couple places that had some damage, but not as many as people think. So, you know, make your next trip out to the Napa and Sonoma and, you know, support the people who uh, lost a lot in the fires. That's fantastic, Rich. Uh, that's very, very cool. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, two kind of final quick questions for you. Where can people you know, find you online and any kind of parting words of advice for those that are listening? Well, first of all, we uh, you could find us online. The, the website for the wine is uh, redstitchwine.com, and you could sign up for our mailing list, and that's how we sell most of our wine. Uh, also, we have uh, Twitter and Instagram uh, under Red Stitch Wine, and I also personally am on Twitter and Instagram at uh, richarillia35. Um, you know, a lot of my stuff on there revolves around baseball and cooking and wine, so uh, – it's something I enjoy doing. And, uh, you know, the advice that uh, I guess I can give to people, and, I, you know, people always ask me in, in baseball terms, like, what, you know, what advice do you give these kids? You know, what can you tell them? And I remember as a kid, like, I hated when somebody told me I couldn't do something. So I would, I would tell people, you know, don't listen to what other people tell you you can't do. Go out and do what you can do and make a difference. And that's what I try and – live my life by good stuff good good note to end on well, rich thank you so much for joining us it's been a lot of fun to chat with you and connect and uh we look forward to uh, trying some of your wine soon absolutely all right guys thanks for the time man i appreciate it so that was our conversation with richard Villia. sean for me that was a lot of fun you know, being a big sports guy what were your takeaways though yeah, number one, what a great guy to talk with. An interesting story going from professional athlete to then wine entrepreneur, essentially. In learning about his backstory, I think a couple of things resonated. I did like how he talked about his perseverance early on that helped him stand out as a professional athlete. And that's a parallel to entrepreneurship as well. You just got to continue on. Um, another thing was the identity crisis that he went through in transition. I know a lot of people that listen to us, they did not start off maybe in the culinary industry and then they transitioned or they're transitioning out maybe from behind the stove like we talked to with with, uh, Richard Blaze and they're becoming more entrepreneurial and diversifying and so it's it, it can be a little challenging changing kind of roles if you will so his, his talk about that and how he handled that was neat and then I think the the last thing was the the brand story that he talked about you know on, on one hand some people might look at him and think that he was a professional athlete he had the ability the resources the platform to be able to launch a product and instantly have success but that's not true right you can you can bring a product to market but it doesn't mean that that people are going to buy it, right? The market's going to determine the viability and the long-term viability, and he's been doing it for a while. And I think what he talked about is having a solid brand story attached with the product. So for anybody that was not a professional athlete, didn't have a, doesn't have a platform built, just think you're only one solid brand story away from your product, your service standing out and jumping into the hearts of consumers and then wanting to engage with you, engage with your business. So I really liked all those points. What about you, Chris? Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely agree with you, man. Uh, you know, a couple of things for me, really, you know, the first, at the very beginning of the conversation, he talked about, you know, what he wished he would have done, which was not take himself so seriously. You know, I think a lot of, especially in the industry we're in, uh, in hospitality, food, you know, it's, it's to take care of people. But at the same time, at the end of the day, it's, it's just food or for him is just, you know, a, a game uh, where, you know, we're not saving lives. We're not sending people to Mars. So, you know, let's just back up a little bit and, and have fun with it. And, you know, if something doesn't go right, it doesn't go right. And you know, just try to kind of move on. And then he talked about having to have patience, you know, whether that's 
as a professional baseball player, as you know, someone kind of working his way up his career, or as a winemaker, or as somebody that's starting a magazine like yourself or a personal brand. So, you know, we don't always have things where we want them, when we want them. But if we, like you said, persevere and keep plugging along, things will pan out uh, if you kind of stay the course, which I know he did, you've done, and I think I've done as well. And, and I think a bunch of great examples of that. So yeah, it was a fun conversation. I had a blast chatting with Rich. Y'all let us know what you think. Uh, you have his social media handles. Shoot him a message on Twitter, Instagram, and let him know that you gave it a listen. And with that, we'll leave you the quote from Rich himself. Don't listen to what other people tell you you can't do. Go out and do what you can do and make a difference. And with that, we're signing off. <laughs>